Good morning and good afternoon. Thanks for joining our webinar. I am your host, Marisabel Caballero. I am Global Technical Manager for Poultry with EW Nutrition, a German-based company. With me, I have two panelists who will support this webinar with both content and technical issues. So let me introduce them. The first one is Ayer Boyar, also Global Technical Manager for Poultry. He's based in the US. And I also have Martin Roa, Regional Technical Manager for Mexico. Let me also explain a couple of technical points to know the setup for the webinar. I will deliver the presentation in about 40 minutes. During the presentation, you can ask questions in the Q&A form that opens when you click the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. If these questions happen to be short and simple, they can be answered in real time by the panelists. If they require a longer or really complex answer, or if they are of interest for the entire audience, we will save them for the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Once again, thank you for being here, and now let's start. We will then uh, talk about what we can do for the chicks in terms of feeding and nutrition to help them to build immunity. But not also that, uh, only that, uh, but also we will learn how to help them to go through states uh, that uh, lead the animals into a constant or chronic inflammation state. But first, let's start by defining immunity. An immunity is no more than the ability of the organism to first recognize and then fight against or resist harmful agents. These harmful agents are also known as antigens. So uh, we have uh, a different um, 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 different triggers uh, that uh, uh, can influence this immune response. So not only the presence of antigens or harmful agents, as we said before, but also uh, we have uh, uh, different pressures uh, that we put uh, the animals into. Just like, for example, the production level that we uh, want and need to achieve today. Also, another um, a source uh, of uh, a pressure is the feed. Um, we uh, want uh, to achieve the best nutrition possible, but at the same time, we want uh, to have the lowest cost possible and uh, we want to play with the raw materials that we have available. So sometimes uh, this can be a challenge for the animal. Moreover, today we also need to take into consideration the worldwide tendency to reduce antibiotics in animal production both as uh, growth promoters and as therapeutics. So in uh, a summary, we need to focus on prevention, not in treatment, when it comes to disease. Um, so uh, we need to keep a pressure on the animals that is as low as possible, but at the same time, we need to make sure that when we need an immune response, this will be shown. So let's um, have a summary, a very brief uh, summary of the immune system, which are the main immune organs that uh, we can find uh, in chickens. And this will be a very quick overview and some basics uh, around immunity in avian species. So um, we have the thymus, the bursa, fabricius, and the bone marrow and uh, these constitute the primary avian lymphoid organs. We also have the spleen and the mucosal associated uh, lymphoid tissues, also known as malt, and uh, uh, these uh, will be the secondary uh, lymphoid organs. The majority of uh, the early immunity we have also to mention is obtained via passive acquisition of uh, maternal antibodies and they are transferred into the yolk sac during the egg formation and, uh, of course, uh, uh, into the chick during uh, the embryonic development. Also, we need uh, to know and uh, to emphasize uh, that the gut or the gut associated lymphoid tissue hosts 70% of the immune cells uh, of the organism. 
this is not happen only with uh, a poetry, but uh, uh, we can say that the gut is the biggest immune organ and also the most important one. The continuous exchange of this tissue with the environment is placing it into a continual challenge. Uh, the challenge is coming uh, from neuromaterials, uh, from microorganisms, including pathogenic microorganisms. So under normal conditions, the mucosal immune system needs to remain tolerant because we, the, it also hosts the microbiome. So um, it needs uh, to, to develop this tolerant to avoid chronic inflammation states. And this uh, chronic inflammation states, of course, can, can be harmful uh, to the animals. So at the same time, we have, uh, let's say, a huge immune organ that needs to remain a little bit silent, so to say, or tolerant. But when an antigen comes, when a harmful agent comes, we need this uh, immune organ to also be quick in its response and uh, have a, a, and deliver against uh, pathogenic challenges. And uh, when uh, we have a chick, it takes about two, the first uh, two weeks of life for, hatch, uh, for the gut associated lymphoid tissue of the chicken to fully mature. And then the general functions of this tissue, because uh, uh, we will not get into the detail, but at least to mention them, are first, the processing and presentation of antigens. Uh, so uh, there are um, specialized cells that uh, have to recognize uh, these uh, uh, harmful agents and have to recognize only them and not uh, the uh, commensal microbiota as an antigen. And uh, this uh, also, uh, this immune uh, organ, the gut, needs to participate in the production of intestinal antibodies. And uh, uh, finally, it needs uh, also to activate, when needed, the cell-mediated immunity. So, we uh, have already talked about uh, two types of uh, immunity. So let's uh, dig a little bit uh, uh, more on the immune response. So the avian uh, immune response is very similar to that of mammals. And it is composed of cellular or innate or cell-mediated immunity and humoral or acquired or antibody-mediated mechanism of defense. So we have uh, basically two. And um, the innate immune response will start uh, with uh, the so-called sentinel cells, uh, such as, uh, for example, the dendritic cells of, uh, or macrophages. They will recognize and trap the antigens. And then uh, they will take little pieces of uh, these uh, harmful agents and uh, start to trigger the inflammatory reaction. And um, the sentinel cells then, like I said, they trap uh, these uh, antigens, they process uh, the proteins, and they present them to the T cells. The T helper cells then very fastly will start to produce chemical messengers, cytokines. And uh, these uh, um, uh, uh, cytokines will start to orchestrate the acquired immunity. We also have uh, uh, some uh, T cells that are a uh, cytotoxin. So they will get rid of pathogens by destroying the cells that they colonize. So uh, let's say that the immune uh, system can also be autodestructive in order uh, to look uh, for um, the higher benefit. Um, uh, uh, then if necessary, the B cells will come and the B cells are activated and uh, participate in the immune response by producing antibodies. The antibodies are specific antigen binding proteins. And uh, the T and B cells, uh, well, they have uh, a kind of uh, magic because uh, they have immunological memory. So they can recognize past challenges uh, once they come over again and they can act accordingly in uh, uh, triggering, again, a secondary immune response. And this is why we can uh, have vaccines. 
for example, well, this is the principle in which uh, vaccines are based. Well, if we have uh, uh, defined which are our immune organs, so we have defined uh, how the immune response is triggered, and now we will talk about some of the influencers of uh, this uh, immune response. And of course, uh, nutrition has a very big role to play here. So let's start with the chicks. But no, let's start before the chicks. The chicks depend on mater maternal antibodies as the main source of uh, passive and natural humoral protection until they will become immunocompetent. And that happens after two weeks, let's remember that. And um, this immunity or this uh, passive immunity, like I said before, has a short duration, so one to two weeks. And uh, its function is uh, to protect young chicks uh, during uh, the first uh, few days or the first uh, couple of weeks of life. Uh, because their immune system is not uh, fully uh, developed. And uh, of course, it's also not ready to react against uh, an early challenge. So uh, what uh, we know as IGYs, uh, they are transferred from the L yolk uh, to the offspring. And uh, this is uh, happening via the embryonic circulation. The transfer starts uh, from uh, day seven of embryonic development and it will reach a maximum three to four days before hatching. The amount of IGY that is uh, transferred into the L yolk and uh, from uh, the serum of the animal uh, into the embryo uh, can be uh, or has been reported to be proportional, of course, uh, to the maternal uh, serum IGY uh, concentrations. And uh, we have here a work that was done by Hamel and uh, uh, his collaborators. They found that uh, between 27 and 30% of the hens uh, IGY is uh, transferred into the progeny. So we want to have a very good immunity in the broiler breeders in order to have a very good immunity in the broilers. Um, but uh, there is uh, other influencers as well. So in terms of vitamins and minerals, well, um, the eggs uh, will have a higher variability than in terms of energy and protein content. And uh, this uh, uh, content of energy, uh, sorry, on, on uh, vitamins and minerals, of course, depends on the feed. So what do we feed the, the broiler breeders? So it depends on the maternal diet, basically. And there is evidence of the beneficial role of maternal vitamin and mineral nutrition in terms of the immunity and the antioxidant status on the progeny. So we have here depicted a work that was done by Amiri and collaborators in a supplementation of vitamin E and uh, the transfer of uh, IGYs uh, from the breeder into the day of chicks. What uh, we can basically see is uh, that higher levels of uh, vitamin E assure higher levels of IGYs in uh, the day of chick. And of course, uh, this uh, can have, uh, so to say, uh, a limit. So it is uh, not an uh, always an increasing curve. But uh, up to 80 in this experiment, uh, international units, there was an increase uh, on the IGY transfer. So to say vitamin E is uh, very important for immunity uh, or for transfer of immunity, but uh, other works have also shown that selenium and zinc are minerals that uh, uh, of course uh, we know have a very, um, a specific role and a very important role to play in a, a maternal a immunity transfer as well. But uh, let's continue with uh, building the immunity. So immediately after the initial feed intake, the chicken intestine is rapidly colonized by a high number of bacteria. The availability of the feed um, and um, a pot has period has been shown to really 
accelerate the intestinal development. So the earlier that the chicks get, the better the intestinal development that we will have. Why? Well, because enzymes are triggered by feed intake. Um, uh, and uh, uh, when we talk about current chicken production, uh, this first meal can be delayed up to 72 hours. And uh, 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 of course, uh, this is uh, not really uh, good uh, for the chickens. In broilers, early feeding, and uh, there are uh, there is a, a very big uh, um, a quantity of experiments uh, into this. A very a good uh, research uh, that demonstrates that early feeding results in an increased weight of the bursa of Fabricius and improve uh, response uh, to disease challenges when compared uh, with uh, chicks uh, that um, have uh, uh, withheld uh, in, uh, into, into feeding. And uh, so, um, uh, for example, uh, we have uh, uh, this uh, experiment uh, from AO et al. in uh, 2015. And uh, uh, this demonstrates that uh, it doesn't matter if you include feed additives, if you didn't feed your six early enough, um, it, 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 um, uh, their, um, uh, their immune system is uh, not developed. And uh, this is um, uh, demonstrated here by a stimulation index. And the stimulation index uh, is an index uh, um, that shows the ability of the T cells to proliferate. So when the animals were not fed immediately after hatch versus a group that was uh, um, a hold uh, for uh, 48 hours without uh, feed and water, uh, then uh, the stimulation index was always higher in uh, uh, the fed chickens. It didn't matter uh, if uh, they were with antibiotics, with mononyl oligosaccharides, with acidifier, doesn't matter. The animals just need feed. They just need this immune system uh, to start to be developed and the stimulus that they need is the feed. Well, we began uh, to talk about the animal's own immune response, um, but uh, uh, when uh, this immune response is activated, the requirements of the animals in terms of nutrition change. And uh, we can see in general a higher demand of energy, amino acids, vitamins, and minerals. Everything takes a uh, Higher, um, a higher amount uh, when uh, we have uh, a simulated uh, immune system. So, in general terms, uh, uh, a consequence of inflammation is a higher nutrient requirement, but at the same time, a consequence of inflammation, unfortunately, is also a lower feed intake. Uh, we can see here uh, below uh, the two graphs show a meta-analysis that was done uh, by um, uh, the team of Remus. And uh, uh, they show the effects of a clostridium or E. coli challenge in broilers in terms of feed intake and also uh, its correlation uh, with daily gain. The results obtained uh, with birds that were challenged with clostridium um, and E. coli indicated that the average daily feed intake was reduced by 17% in uh, the case of clostridium and 9% in the case of E. coli. And uh, the average daily gain was further reduced by uh, 40% in the case of clostridium and 10% in the case of E. coli. Why do we have a further reduction in terms of uh, average daily gain? Well, because the immune system needs energy, amino acids, vitamins, and minerals uh, to uh, develop the immune response. And if the animal is not eating, it will use the resources that it already has. So an immune response, like we said, costs a lot of energy, costs a lot of amino acids, uh, and uh, any deficiency of uh, essential nutrients will hinder the immune system. 
Um, so we see here uh, that uh, when uh, we talk about the different stages, so for example, in a uh, challenge animals, the, uh, we will need a higher quantity of uh, nutritional resources, but at the same time, an immunological challenge uh, will also uh, be resulting in tissue damage, uh, which uh, uh, of course, uh, hinders uh, these animals into their development, growth, and uh, of course, uh, productivity as well. Well, um, also, when we talk a continuous stimulation of the immune system, um, uh, uh, we already uh, mentioned uh, that it reduces growth and alters nutrient utilization. Um, uh, so the supply of the right nutrients at the appropriate times and uh, at the appropriate amounts as well is critical for the development, maintenance and function of the immune system. So uh, when uh, uh, we speak on a body weight basis, lymphocytes, granulocytes and macrophages, uh, so very uh, important cells of the immune system, they will constitute 0.4% of the body weight of the chick. And in terms of nutritional requirements, the immune system or the immunity will take 9% of what we are feeding uh, to the broilers. Which uh, nutrients are important here? So for example, energy and amino acids are important nutrients uh, for uh, the, cell, uh, the cells like lymphocytes, granulocytes, and uh, macrophages that remember constitute 0.4% of the immune cells. Um, uh, cells of the innate immune system do not really proliferate when activated, but they produce healing compounds. So they produce uh, um, uh, for example, reactive oxygen and nitrogen species uh, that uh, will heal the cells uh, that uh, the harmful agents or the antigens are colonizing. And for this, of course, uh, they need resources. Resources like glucose, glutamine, and arginine. So these are very important building blocks. And uh, we all know uh, for experience uh, that a disease or excessive inflammation has a negative impact on growth. And then so uh, following uh, an activation of the immune system, it will become normally anabolic and will increase its nutrient demand. And at the same time, let's remember, we mentioned that before as well, it intake decreases. Um, uh, when uh, we have uh, uh, nutritional deficiencies, they will uh, also have a negative impact in the animal's immune status. Um, so it's not only in terms of energy and protein, uh, but uh, uh, it is also important to consider micronutrients such as zinc, selenium, iron, copper, beta-carotene, uh, vitamins A, C, and E. Uh, we need to consider folic acid. Uh, we need uh, uh, to consider uh, as well uh, that uh, the balance of uh, vitamins and minerals influence several components of uh, the non-specific immune system. And uh, the thing is uh, that antigens will uh, lead the animals uh, to a highly accelerated rate of skeletal muscle degradation because we stop feed intake, but the resources are needed. And the animal is needed amino acid to be released into the plasma. Why? Well, because the liver needs to use these amino acids in order to synthesize the acute phase proteins that are needed as chemical messengers among others. And uh, uh, the spleen also increases uh, protein synthesis at the same time because uh, there are cytokines that get activated and tell the immune system to do something. Uh, so basically to react. So um, the spleen needs to activate the production of uh, uh, immune cells. And, uh, and then uh, the immune tissues and uh, the cells, they will increase um, let's say um, and the need of uh, transporters of uh, their resources as well. So for example, lysine, arginine, and glucose. 
and uh, uh, of course uh, this will take a lot of resources to the animal um, or from the animal so to say that uh, is uh, already um, uh, lowering the feed intake so um, in industrial productions the animals are subject to stress in, uh, uh, in uh, normally so uh, but especially at certain moments in their life and uh, this stress uh, can affect uh, the defense. This stress can affect immunity. And the stressors uh, include, uh, for example, well, heat stress, so environmental stress is one of the most known, but also um, uh, issues like high stock density, uh, like a change of diet, like nutritional uh, deficiencies, or Anti-nutritional factors can also be a source of stress. And stress produces uh, a, also a stimulation of the immune system. But the thing is uh, that an immune system that is uh, chronically under alert or that is a uh, chronically um, uh, simulated is uh, also is something that is not good for the animal. Um, and uh, we have uh, some of uh, uh, the factors uh, that can produce a uh, chronic inflammation already in uh, the feed, uh, for example. Uh, we have uh, our animals uh, uh, being um, uh, selected for a high feed intake. But at the same time, uh, sometimes we put anti-nutritional factors uh, such as, uh, for example, non-starch polysaccharides into the feed. And uh, uh, we have a nutrient excess or an overload of uh, nutrients and metabolites. And uh, uh, this overload of nutrients uh, can act as uh, um, a danger associated molecular uh, pattern or damp, and uh, this will activate uh, some uh, cellular receptors uh, like the TLR4 or the NLR, uh, NLR uh, that uh, will uh, increase the production of uh, pro inflammatory cytokines as a result of their activation. And uh, uh, then, um, well, uh, this uh, chronic inflammation uh, response uh, will start. Uh, so there's a change in the uh, different metabolic pathways. Uh, and uh, uh, as a result, uh, we will have a, a higher uh, production of prostaglandins uh, stimulating the immune system. And at the same time, a higher um, oxygen and uh, yeah, uh, uh, oxygen um, uh, compounds uh, and uh, nitrogen compounds that lead to, to oxidative stress. And uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, this is uh, something that is not triggered only uh, by NSPs, uh, but it can be triggered also by mycotoxins. So we know uh, that among the stressors uh, that, uh, can, um, uh, that can stimulate uh, the immune response or the contrary, uh, that can be uh, suppressors of the immune response, uh, we have uh, mycotoxins. Although in realistic and occasional uh, doses of uh, mycotoxins, we have in general terms an upregulation of uh, um, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. So uh, in, uh, in the table that we are presenting here, half of uh, the cytokines, uh, the top half of the cytokines uh, we have listed are pro-inflammatory and the half uh, bottom are anti-inflammatory. So in uh, uh, general terms, mycotoxins have uh, uh, an inflammatory effect uh, when uh, they are uh, taken uh, by the animal at realistic and occasional doses, although uh, they can be uh, also immune suppressors uh, at uh, some point when they have higher doses. Um, uh, but we also need to remember that when we have a uh, breeder hens uh, that are exposed to mycotoxins, uh, well, through the feed, the progeny also may suffer the consequences. And it is not only because mycotoxins or some mycotoxins can pass into the egg, 
I think this is the least of the problems because for that you need really high levels of mycotoxins. But uh, the main issue here is uh, that uh, we may have uh, problems in nutrient uh, transporters into the egg or in uh, the, the, the deposition of uh, IgYs into the egg or even uh, in uh, the deposition of calcium and phosphorus into the egg and uh, this leads uh, to differences in the exchange uh, of gases uh, with the medium and may also uh, then in, uh, in this way uh, lead to um, embryonic mortality. But uh, uh, passing uh, from uh, mycotoxins, um, uh, we uh, also need to take into consideration that um, environmental conditions or stress factors can affect the animal's capacity to defend itself against pathogens. And uh, uh, in these conditions, it is worth to give uh, some extra aid to the animals. So to consider some immunomodulatory nutrients. So at the right amount, some nutrient inclusions can have a positive, a very positive influence in a supporting a tissue repair, for example, or a can a have a positive influence on stimulating the development of the activity of the immune system. And in general, uh, immunological stress, we said, decreases feed intake. Um, and, but uh, what we can consider then is to have a higher energy diet. And uh, uh, we can see uh, that uh, by uh, using a uh, different um, oil sources, uh, for example, that uh, may, or, or higher uh, oil sources or different oil sources that uh, may provide uh, the animals uh, with um, a, a better uh, source of um, um, fatty, uh, of dietary fatty acids. But in principle, of course, uh, it depends uh, on our objectives. And uh, we can see uh, that, uh, for example, to support adaptive immunity, uh, we can record to nutrients like vitamin E, like uh, vitamin A, uh, like uh, uh, omega-3 uh, fatty acids, like lutein and conjugated linoleic acids. Um, also, uh, uh, we have uh, here in the graph how different uh, nutrients uh, can um, let's say influence uh, when we go uh, to the left uh, pro-inflammatory or when we go to the right anti-inflammatory cytokines. So uh, we see uh, that, um, uh, for example, a uh, vitamin E will uh, have an anti-inflammatory effect uh, such uh, as lutein as well uh, in uh, uh, poultry animals. So yes, uh, some nutrients uh, can have a positive influence. And uh, before we were also mentioning uh, other uh, nutrients uh, such as zinc and uh, selenium. Um, the role of feed additives. So uh, we have uh, nutrients or feed compounds uh, that can give an additional support uh, to the immune system. Um, but uh, we also can talk about uh, some feed additives that can uh, also have an influence on the immune response of the animal. Uh, these uh, uh, feed additives or different feed additives have different functions, uh, such as, for example, blocking the colonization um, of uh, the intestine, for example, by pathogens, uh, or uh, they can directly uh, modulate the immune response. Um, but uh, also some feed additives can aid um, in uh, the repair of tissue and uh, they can lower oxidative stress. Uh, so this, uh, these uh, types of, um, uh, of feed additives will be very useful uh, when we have stressed animals or uh, animals in the, in the most stressful periods. And of course, uh, we have other feed additives like, for example, antibiotic growth promoters that have a direct antibacterial effect and uh, therefore uh, that uh, uh, help uh, also antibiotic group promoters have other ways into helping uh, with the modulation of uh, the immunity in the animals um, but uh, uh, yes uh, this is uh, another uh, function of feed additives uh, so to mention others uh, uh, that have uh, let's say 
antimicrobial effects, we can mention organic acids or a phytomolecules as well. And uh, at, the, at, the, at the bottom line, uh, we need to choose um, the feed additives uh, that will support more the health of the animals uh, and uh, that will support the animals in uh, different ways, so to say. Uh, that uh, may have antioxidant and antimicrobial effects at the same time, uh, for example. And uh, due to the constant interaction uh, between a uh, microbiota and host immune system, well, when we have changes in the microbial uh, composition, uh, we do affect the host immunity. And uh, this uh, is uh, uh, yeah, let's say a part of uh, how antibiotic growth promoters uh, are working uh, in order to uh, support the immune system of the animal. So uh, in the study in uh, which animals were receiving uh, doses of antibiotics and then a challenge, and the challenge is here uh, at uh, day uh, 105, uh, well, uh, the challenge animals that were receiving antibiotics, uh, they show a lower uh, concentration of IgM and IgYs after um, the, the challenge. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, this shows how uh, antibiotics uh, can uh, modulate uh, immune response. But uh, not only these animals have had fewer antibodies, uh, but the antibiotic uh, exposure led to a reduction in the spleen size. A few, the animals had a fewer pear patches, they had enlarged Zika, and uh, uh, in the general terms, their immune organs, uh, so to say, uh, were uh, less noticeable or less developed. And uh, um, uh, the author of, um, of of, uh, of the study uh, compares uh, to a phenotypical resemblance uh, with uh, germ-free or specific pathogen-free animals. In uh, uh, this other study, uh, it's a more recent study by uh, Kumar in 2018, uh, what uh, we can see on the top uh, are uh, the pro-inflammatory and on the bottom the anti-inflammatory uh, cytokines in uh, animals uh, that uh, uh, belong to a control group or without antibiotics or uh, belong uh, to a group of animals uh, fed uh, with uh, BMD. Um, when it comes to beta defensin, uh, there is um, a significantly lower expression uh, in uh, the BMD group but uh, not in TLR4, for example, or interleukin-10. But when it comes uh, to anti-inflammatory cytokines, uh, there is uh, still, uh, let's say, a difference uh, at some point uh, with, uh, um, uh, or uh, let's say, in favor of uh, um, the antibiotic growth promoter uh, receiving group. So do antibiotics uh, help or aid to lower chronic inflammation? The short answer is yes, but this is not without consequences. And uh, the main uh, consequence uh, that uh, we can uh, see right now is uh, antimicrobial resistance. And uh, not only antimicrobial resistance per se, uh, that is a consequence of the misuse uh, of uh, antibiotics, but also, um, uh, antimicrobial resistance mechanisms may also have a negative impact on immunity. And this is uh, a preliminary studies, uh, and, uh, and these studies uh, were done in rats and not in chicks. Um, uh, but uh, what uh, we can say is uh, that, uh, for example, Staphylococcus aureus, uh, when it uh, becomes a uh, resistance uh, to uh, certain antibiotics, uh, it also changes on its structure. It produces a thicker membrane. And this uh, thicker membrane allows an evasion of uh, uh, this microbe by neutrophils. So this impairs immunity. 
Another experiment, uh, for example, uh, from a uh, Jason Yang, he has seen uh, that multi-resistant E. coli uh, strains uh, have a higher survival in the presence of macrophages. So that means that somehow the antimicrobial resistance mechanisms also provide a mechanism to be more resistant against the immune system of the host. So they both occur simultaneously. And uh, of course, this is uh, one more reason uh, to worry about antimicrobial resistance. So going back uh, from antimicrobial resistance uh, to immunity and to factors in the feed uh, that uh, can, uh, for example, uh, trigger inflammation, uh, we need uh, to talk about uh, um, uh, non-starch polysaccharides and uh, the positive effect that the NSP enzymes can have there. So uh, when we have a fiber-rich diet, and uh, we uh, do not have enzymes, uh, we have the risk to have a lot of undigested feed, that is undigested feed, uh, then, uh, uh, then it leads to a slower passage of uh, the feed uh, through the gastrointestinal tract. And uh, this, uh, uh, of course, um, stimulates or is, uh, um, is a factor uh, that can promote the growth of uh, pathogenic bacteria in the intestine and can be a factor of uh, chronic inflammation or stimulation of the immune system. But when we have enzymes, uh, and, and these enzymes uh, are not, uh, are not uh, in, in the chick, so they are not uh, provided by nature, uh, we need uh, to uh, provide uh, these enzymes that uh, added into the feed. And the dietary supplementation of uh, uh, enzymes uh, containing, for example, uh, silanases um, enhances the immune response uh, of broiler chickens. Uh, and uh, it also uh, helps, uh, of course, uh, with the digestion of uh, these uh, fiber-rich uh, diets. And, uh, Jan, uh, and uh, uh, collaborators uh, show it uh, by uh, having a lower levels of alpha-1 acid glycoprotein uh, in the serum of animals that uh, have uh, uh, enzyme uh, into the feed. And this is, uh, let's say, a component uh, that appears uh, when we have uh, inflammation or chronic inflammation. Another way to help the animals is uh, through uh, feed additives containing uh, phytomolecules and uh, uh, these uh, feed additives and these feed additives uh, can have anti-inflammatory actions um, and so uh, for example in the graph uh, that we can see on the left uh, we see how uh, some uh, inflammation indicators are lowered uh, when uh, the animals are uh, receiving uh, phytomolecules into the diet versus a control group without uh, the phytomolecules. So these uh, animals uh, will be uh, prone uh, or will be less uh, prone uh, to uh, chronic uh, inflammation as shown by a uh, pure leaf uh, in 2018. But uh, uh, this is in non-challenge animals. What happens when we have a challenge and we need this immune response? Well, f molecules can also help uh, the organism to uh, produce uh, this immunity as uh, we see in uh, this study by Abad. And this study is uh, showing uh, titers again against the Newcastle disease in a vaccinated animals uh, that um, uh, are uh, also um, uh, receiving uh, phytomolecules. And so and the orange line is uh, showing how the animals uh, receiving phytomolecules have higher titers, showing uh, the beneficial effects uh, that uh, phytomolecules uh, can uh, have also in uh, immune response when it's needed. In EW Nutrition, we also uh, have uh, done uh, this trial to show 
what the positive effect of phytomolecules can be in a chronically um, uh, inflammated animal, so in animals uh, with a chronic inflammation response that was stimulated uh, by a um, diet uh, rich on uh, um, non-starch uh, polysaccharides. These animals are high brown, highline brown uh, laying hens, and uh, in uh, both uh, groups, the control and uh, the group with the EW nutrition and uh, phytomolecule-based programs, the diet contain 40% uh, of wheat. The EW nutrition a uh, phytomolecule program consists into products and uh, one uh, that is applied into the feed at the rate of 100 grams per ton, and another one uh, that is applied um, uh, in the, the water for drinking at the rate of uh, 250 milliliters per cubic meter of water at uh, some point uh, in the production. So it was given uh, up to week uh, 25. Um, uh, the trial had eight replicates uh, and a 36 animal per replicate and was done in China. Um, so what uh, was uh, the positive effect uh, uh, of, the my, uh, of the phytomolecules uh, here? Well, let's remember uh, that, uh, that high fiber diets uh, have a chronic uh, or produce a chronic state of inflammation and this chronic state of inflammation uh, will uh, reduce uh, productivity like uh, we see here. So we have our control group that is depicted in uh, the blue bar, and uh, these are expert in house. And uh, uh, when we compare the, the EW uh, nutrition program, uh, we see that we have uh, more than a 3x of advantage. But um, to have a second um, a control group, uh, we also compared it uh, with a hens that were fed a corn-based diet. So what happens, let's say, with the normal non-challenge situation? Well, it also took uh, some eggs uh, of advantage, and uh, not as much as uh, the phytomolecule group, uh, but uh, what we can see is that, yes, the animals in the control group are uh, receiving the 40% uh, with diets, they were challenged and they lowered their productivity. We can also see it uh, in uh, the body weight uh, of uh, the hens, uh, so the body weight uh, along the trial. And so starting at uh, the second, um, um, the second uh, weighing uh, that occurred at 19 weeks, uh, we can see that uh, both groups start separating and then the separation is more evident as the, the time passes, so as the animals are chronically inflammated. And uh, finally, of course, this uh, chronic state of inflammation and uh, this unbalanced diet affects gut health as evidenced by the microbiome diversity. So we see the control group in blue and uh, the EW Nutrition a program group in red. And the EW Nutrition a program showed a higher microbiota diversity, which is an indicator that is related with a good gut health. So the bottom line, do, mito, do phytomolecules help? Yes, they can help a chronically inflammated animals uh, to achieve a better gut health and performance. What are the key messages uh, from today? Well, the key messages are basically that uh, the immune system is a dynamic and complex system and it requires proper care and feeding. Can we have a standard nutrient requirement for immunity? Well, no, this will be an oversimplification. We have diverse stressors uh, in, uh, uh, during the lives of the animals that uh, may require and will require different responses. What can we use as a guideline? Well, we can use general good nutrition and feeding guidelines. Uh, this should always be applied. So perfectly well-balanced diets, uh, probably a support of vitamins and minerals in uh, some points uh, of um, 
stress uh, of the animals, uh, but also we can use a support from feed additives, including phytomolecules in some stressful times in the animals or all along uh, the lives of the animals as we can find stress in uh, most uh, growing stages of broilers, uh, for example. So, uh, to repeat that, uh, some feeding strategies and their combinations, they do can promote uh, certain responses in the animals or they can support the immune response in the animals. And this is very important, especially in antibiotic reduction scenarios. So, um, when uh, we are producing uh, without antibiotics, we uh, have seen uh, the very good effects of specific feed additives uh, showing uh, positive results in uh, the, um, uh, let's say, uh, the multidisciplinary or holistic approach uh, of uh, gut health or animal health. And uh, of course, uh, this includes immunity. So uh, thank you very much for your attention so far. And uh, let's go uh, to the question and answer session. And uh, until the next time, I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, I would like to invite you to a uh, future webinars uh, that we will be announcing either by LinkedIn and uh, in our website as well. Thanks uh, for your attention and until the next time.